2019. Uh, she's been photographing since she was seven years old when her family gave her a brownie camera. And she's lived most of her life taking photographs. As she says, I don't go to photograph, I photograph where I'm going. After 31 years plus years as a public school art teacher in New York City, she retired and began to go through her amazing archive of photographs and started to publish and exhibit her work. She's published two books and she has another one coming out in the next few months, which I'm sure we'll hear more about in a few minutes. Um, just a few highlights of her exhibition record include uh, Mass MoCA, the DIA Art Foundation, the Brooklyn Museum, the New Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. She is represented by the Clamp Art Gallery and has an exhibition coming up in the fall. And she lives in New York City and Woodstock, New York. So take it away, Meryl. I think you're muted. There we go. Again, everybody, nice to feel you in this Zoom presence together. And thank you, Mary Lee, for the introduction. I will just, I'll just start off with showing you one thing she did mention. My first camera was from age seven, and this is it. And I took, besides having a little diary, <laughs> no, a little teen photo, photo album and how significant this, this is because I haven't changed. Do people change? They evolve. Okay. Okay. And, and you will tell me Screen or yep, and then just go to the top there and start the slideshow. Uh, should be under view, view or window, one of those. Start. And then click right. from start. Um, there you there go. go. Beautiful. Hey, thank you. Well, I'll just start off by saying the fact that light work and Shane and all of you picked this image to start off is like it's a picture of my mother dancing at a at a a friend of ours, second wedding, and she is dancing in heaven, knowing that this is the cover image of the, of the catalog of the show and the poster, and says a lot about everything. You heard I was a teacher, it's true. So I'm giving everyone an assignment right now. Many of you are involved in photography, many are, are probably not, or maybe you have something else. When I say the word camera, or I say the word photograph, or refer to it, think of something else that is your passion or interest of yours. It could be cooking, it could be watching TV, it could be watching, going to movies, painting, whatever it is, playing music, listening to music, substitute it, because it's all the same thing. It's all related, I should say. And no one, no, no one's, very few people come from out of nowhere, or like Zeus from you know the god's head. You know, there are people who came before us that inspired us along the way. My dad, Jack Meisler, was a printer by trade. But in addition to being a great auto mechanic, that skill I didn't get, my brother did, he was a passionate photographer, and his subject was his friends, his family, his life. I want to show you a few of them because seeing his work in our family albums and also he was doing it at every special occasion had a great influence. Self-portrait in the Coast Guard with his pals. His girlfriend, my mother, Times Square. That little Meryl on mom's lap in the Bronx with some people who aren't relatives. They were just some people they knew. A stranger with a, a kid on the street with their, his cat. 
I know that they spent a summer um, in Long Island at a cottage. He put, saw someone snoozing. And while in the Coast Guard stationed in, in San Francisco, the trolley cars, and a portrait of his own father, my grandfather, Murray Meisler. Whenever I saw my grandfather, he had a serious camera on him. You can see it on his shoulder there, the straps, and a light meter, and the light meter was in your face. He was, it said that he built his own camera. Yet, I think I saw one of his photographs while he was live that he sent, sent to us. It wasn't even important. It's like the act of photography itself is what it's important unto itself. So when the story of Vivian Meyer came out about a nanny who didn't share her work besides relating to it on many levels of my own, I understand that. I understand just taking photographs is something you do like whistling or singing. And there I am with my first camera and it still works. My first subjects, my family, my little brother, school trips with the Girl Scouts. Uh, yes, for Mary, I brought my little Girl Scout uniform. I'll show you later. Friends on the block. So this is seven-year-old Meryl. And these subjects never changed. But the first time I saw a really, a photography exhibit, I went to MoMA. I saw the 1972 Dion Arbus show. I didn't go specifically to see it, but I went to saw the show. And what can I say? It moved me. I felt it. I was inspired. Uh, I related to it. These little people and they are, this reminded me of my, my cousins and my aunts and uncle and grandparents in the Bronx, their apartments. To me, it felt very familiar. And a warmth to it. I started to, when I was going to graduate school, I went to undergraduate in art education. I, when I went to grad school, I thought I would just take a, a real photography class to learn how to use a real camera. And the professor, there was only one professor there at the University of Wisconsin, Ma Madison, named Cavalier Ketchum, and he exposed Photo 101 students to many photographers' work. One that really hit me was Jacques Henri Lartigue, because he photographed, he was a painter who later on in life started showing his, his photographs from childhood and of his family and friends and, and the aristocratic Parisian family, just having fun together. It gave me the idea to, to, to go back and photograph my family and friends. But other work that I, I saw influenced me, inspired me, Louis Hine, Dorothy Lang, Walker Evans, when I photographed on the subways, I felt like Walker Evans. The juxtapositions of Margaret Burke's white imagery. I, I think you'll see later on the juxtapositions are a lot of part of my life and my vision. Henri Carrier Barson. Helen Levitt, you'll see later on in my school pictures in walking the streets of Bush with photographing the kids. Helen Levitt was whispering on my shoulder. And is feeling almost Roman Vishniak, well, as a Jew, and also just as a person knowing that anything could disappear anytime. I'm always very, very conscious of that. And I had the good fortune, and I, the fortuitous and sorted out was when I moved to New York, it was purposely to take a class with Lizette Modell. And you can see in her snapshot aesthetic definitely appeals to my own. My nightlife photographs, I felt like I was Versailles. That this, his photographs of Paris in the 30s, the 20s, the 30s, and these wild scenes that couldn't be shown for decades. When I was going out to nightclubs, or when I go out to nightclubs, I still feel that influence. But what got me digging into my own archives? There are actually people closer to me that I knew 
Marlene Godfrey is a friend of mine. She's in heaven now, but she's a friend of mine. And seeing her work, her earlier work, getting resurfaced and made into books was an inspiration. Rebecca Lepkos is a very close friend of a very close friend of mine who helped her make his, her website. And all of a sudden her work was out there. Her work from the thirties had a new life. Ruth Gruber is, a, is an ex, my mishpoka, my extended family. And the fact that Ruth didn't start having solo shows of her work until she was in her eighties, like we're not too late kids this time. When I started digging in my work and I was midst of it through some circumstances, the, the story of Vivian Meyer came up while I was in the midst of it. I said, this sounds very familiar. A nanny, oh gee, I was a teacher. She didn't show her work. Well, I did, I always did show my work. Maybe not my straight photographs, but my work. It, and it gave me an impetus to dig through my own work and instead of a stranger discovering it, having the good fortune of discovering it and not having a loss, let me find it in my own time. So I encourage you, because you all have large archives. I know you do, you live life. Start digging. Everyone feels stuck. If, if you're someone who's ever felt stuck, you're fortunate. I've noticed being feeling stuck. I had a major epiphany in the strangest place. It was in a bazaar, a drag and burlesque house nightclub in Bushwick, Brooklyn in 2000 and, in 2013. And I went to visit it and I go into the restroom and there's a disco ball up ahead. I go outside, you know, thinking, wait, there's a disco ball over the dance floor. Wait, I'm in Bushwick. Bushwick was the place that in 1977, when there was a blackout and I was supposed to go to Studio 54 and it was closed. And the next day, the whole world heard about this hellhole full of Bushwick. And I never thought I'd end up being there or seek it out. And I ended up teaching there. And, and yet all of a sudden, the, the art scene was in Bushwick. The nightclub scene was in Bushwick. And it was influenced my life so dramatically that I realized boom, 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 synapse. It's something happened. And I realized I have, this work belongs together. I have all these night, these night, nightlife photographs that go with my bushwork photographs. And and it and the guy who owned this um, drag burlesque house wanted me to show him the work in the basement. And I thought he was out of his mind. But then I realized this is the perfect place to show this work. I had an epiphany. Bizarre, the Greg Burlesque show house that I had my first show in, not my first show, but showing the first time I ever showed my disco photographs in nightlife ended up becoming my publisher. It's, it is bizarre, but within six months, a decision to make a book together and, do, and, and make it happen, it came out. My spouse, Patricia O'Brien, designed it. And, and that's, I said, when, when he said he wanted to publish a book, I said, I, well, I wanna show my disco work, not just my motion work, but my disco work with it. And John said, disco work, really? really? I said, yes, it's a long story, but it all goes together. And, and, and he, he said, well, can I see it? I said, well, I have to find it and I have to scan it because I've never shown it to anybody. And I put together some samples and, and it happened. It was like a miracle. And so yeah, I'm gonna show you the, the, the concept of the book. It's, it's my friend, Judy Jupiter, we're being rejected from Studio 54 that night. Big deal, went someplace else. Contrasted with some little kids on the block where I taught on Palmetto Street in Bushwick. I was teacher there for 13 of my 31 years as a teacher. And I carried a point and shoot camera. They seem to go well together. They do go well together. <laughs> or for example, this, oh, actually the night rejected Studio 54 were big deals. Don't go another night. Went to Gigi Barnum's instead, which is a, which, which had performers overhead. It was a huge, now we would say transgender 
performers and population. The, the trapeze artists contrasted to a family on, on a swing. Made the sense, you know. To me, they work perfectly well together. Now I'm going to just point out some luminaries that I didn't, you know, realize at the time. The person with a little blue arrow there. There are other other people as well. This is Potassa de la de Lafayette. I just knew Potassa because I would dance with Potassa, and Potassa would let me photograph her. I said, "Oh, I'm Potassa." But Potassa was really was a legend. And it wasn't just Studio 54. There were so many clubs. They were popping up everywhere, and I checked out probably all of them in, in Manhattan. Then to go over to Brooklyn or Queens is like, a, that was the bridge and tunnel crowd. It was different. So it's kind of really fantastic that now the bridge and tunnel crowd are the cool kids. So here's Patata. Patata was uh, hung around, was part of the entourage of Salvador Dali, one of his favorite friends to hang out with, was the subject of Andy Warhol. He said, so he photographed by Loxia Lewitt, by Andy Warhol. And sadly, sadly, Potassa de la Fayette, no one seems to know what happened to Potassa. And, and, it's, and also sadly, we know that so many transgender people's lives are ended way before their time. But no one seems to know where, where or how. Yes, there was drugs, was a carrying case, it's Studio 54. I remember what locker room smelled like and winging out in hurrahs, getting a little sniff before him. But this, when I showed this photograph to someone who lives on in Bushwick, I always just thought it was a, a nice looking boy and it made, made me look, think of Sherlock Holmes. He said, this kid, Work as a drug runner. I said, What? He said, he said, Look at that coat. The hat, the clothes. Those coats were like several hundred dollars. He was being clothed, kept for, was probably on the lookout for, to make sure someone could do a deal. It never dawned on me. But kids in school would always wear their coats and not put them in the locker because they didn't want them stolen. This was a view from one of the classrooms. A social studies classroom. My school was like right in the epicenter of where several blocks had been burnt out during not just a blackout, but something called the oil alarm fire. But then you saw a building going up. It was changed. This building is literally part of a development called Hope Gardens. And going back towards the school, I would photograph things I couldn't resist. And if you're a photographer, you know, you just can't resist. It calls to you. So I, when I photograph things, I thought the beautiful light, because the, the, the light of the area was so beautiful. I'm not surprised it became an area that a lot of artists live in now. And then the nightlife, more nightlife. The little blue arrow here, I did not know it, but some another photographer pointed out that this person here, oh, she, she was every, this performer was everywhere. This is Marcus Leatherdale. This is a portrait of Marcus Leatherdale by Robert Mapplethorpe and Robert Mapplethorpe by Marcus Leatherdale. Marcus Leatherdale is, is alive and well and we have since been acquainted through the internet because <laughs> he's in Portugal and world India. And so he's alive and well and still making art and images. The next book was this one. So it came a year later, back in the 70s. Because a lot of people, when they react, saw my photographs, they saw humor in them, but it was also surprised that the Bushwick photographs, even though the backgrounds and the area looked disheveled or distressed, people were just kind of living their lives and having fun. And, and I said, you know what? I think I need to explain where I come from. Bizarre immediately wanted to do another book because this one was like a, a, a shocking, a worldwide sensation. I said, I want to show you where I come from. I come from a 
heritage of humor. And, and so I decided I want to focus on my life in growing up on Long Island and moving into the city, those contrasts or how those worlds meshed and became one. If you think, like here's one of the early portraits of, of me by my dad as a ballerina, a ballet school recital. <laughs> and so it was very natural on my first, my first coming home taking photo 101, I immediately started taking photographs of friends, family, and I started doing self portraits. This was in 1973. 74 and self-portrait in the tutu a foreign star made perfect sense to me this tra this transition i had not heard of cindy sherman in fact i went to buffalo state college where she went i never took a photo class there but in the book i i transpose the falling star and I had a side job uh, when I moved to New York besides being an Ill illustrator and going out at night. I also was a hostess at GoGo -Go Boris and sometimes I brought my camera and it's one of my GoGo -Go girls. And here we are on the go with this my friend Judy Jupiter on her birthday party. We, were, we worked at the same GoGo -Go bar and then different ones and we're celebrating her birthday and you can see the police was just right there, he just turned his head, no big deal. This is the, he, he has another arrow. This is at the Coyote Hookers Masquerade Ball, my first big disco experience, February 14th, 1977. And Coyote was cast off your old tired ethics. It was like a, a union for sex workers for having a party. And I got myself in there. This guy over here is smiling. This is Charles Gatewood. He, you see, notice he's the person not where, using his camera. He's looking just like a few back. Marcus Leatherdale, he wasn't photographing. He was looking. Photographers look a lot as well. And Charles, not many, many, many books. He was also an artist in residence at Lightwork. Any, any image makers out there, Check out light work. It's amazing. Apply to be an IR artist in residence. Just become a member. Their, their, print, their printing services are incredible and very reasonable. Kids on the block. I walked up and down this block every day for like you know, 13 years. Because even when I was taking the subway, when I eventually had a car and parked it in a lot next to it. So kids on the block going to a disco at night. There were a lot of theme parties. Somebody, somebody, a graduate student just recently interviewed me about nightly life. How was it different? I said, well, of course there were no cell phones and it's probably a good thing and or email. So you heard about parties through invitations, physical invitations, someone physically putting your name on a list. And I was always interested, more interested in people. Not just celebrities. Whoever was there, everyone's important. This is one of the performers who's when she is, I have her name written down and I can't find out what happened to her. Her she's she was amazing. Up in the DJ booths at Studio 54. This woman I remember is Patu. She was a croupier at Atlantic City, she's Parisian. This guy over here with the blue being photographed. Actually, the next person over you don't see in the, in the corner is a really famous paparazzi. But this person here painting himself silver with his partner and then kissing over here the silver kiss was a popular performer of many of the nightclubs. And he was named Mark Stevens. Mark Stevens was a star of numerous numerous porn films. I didn't even know it at the time. I just thought it was really interesting. And he's the subject of Robert Michaelthorpe. His, his nickname was Mr. Ten and a Half, and I think you could see why. And 
a woman in, in their ladies' room or a person in the ladies' room at Studio 54, just the, the glamour. You never know who you'd find at a ladies' room or what would be going on. I also photographed the men's rooms, heading into a, another club at night, just catching the moment. They said, this is my friend, Judy Jupiter, we're still friends. And we went, we went clubbing a lot together. At the time, I did not realize this, this was a very famous music, musician at CBGB. I, at CBGB, I just knew this was a great face, a great look, a great, great looking person. And in his sneer is similar to this girl I photographed. She, I knew, she was one of my students, Marisol on Knickerbocker Avenue and the other little girl next to the school. Knickerbocker Avenue was, was like the drug capital. You get anything you wanted there. And how funny or how similar or how amazing how expressive it's the same. So that's Steve Bader's of the Dead Boys at CBGB and that's Marisol on Knickerbocker Avenue. They're both equally important and equally unique. Only the kids were, you know, the neighborhood may have looked down and out. They were dressed impeccably. Just so conscious of how they looked. And looking at images again and again, you know, when you see people who study the Bible or Torah or the Quran, or they could be in the subway or on a bench and they're reading the same passages, see they highlight things. It's like they're studying the same thing and seeing new insights, but looking at my images and whatever you look at, you see new things. Again, like I didn't notice how, like I didn't even notice that her mouth was sticking out or how, it, how impossible it is for that form to figure, to, to be on that shoulder so casually in a split second. It wasn't until Lightwork did the book, the contact sheet, which, may I plug it? This is a 50 page $12 bargain it's printed in Duotone. Anyone's ever had their work printed knows how expensive that is. And they're giving it away, okay? My, this, this book is sold out. It's a collector's item. People sell it for $500 and up. You can get those images that here for $12 and support light work. But I didn't notice until I looked at the book that the hand was in the cup. I never saw it. What a nice surprise. Also during this period of the 70s, I was a CETA photographer, which, which Comprehensive Employment Training Act which was like the WPA of the 70s. And we're a seat of, seat of people are, are alive and well, many of us. And we wanted to get it, we're trying to get it known now as a model, a more current working model of artists being hired to do public artworks. I worked for the American Jewish Congress, documenting Jewish New York and doing my own family roots. But I created an archive of New York City of Jewish New York in particular, but there were a lot of theater photographers for different agencies. We, we made an incredible archive and we're gonna get it out there. But we also want this administration to use as a model to hire artists to do work for the public good. But the themes, that, it's the same theme, themes, you know, whether that's Jewish New York, so is this, the kid I, this is the boy I babysit with for on his farm mitzvah since he was two years old. Kids who lose other, I know that they grew up on the block where I, I grew up on. The fashion, the style, love this. And I lived on, I lived literally <laughs> 10 feet of that tree, my first apartment in New York, subletting a room in a cousin's apartment and these boys, hang, this boy hanging out in a tree and the tree is still there, it's missing a branch and, but it's still there and the memory is still there. Another of my subjects when I was coming back, when it's a lot of these work were when I was 
still in my two years in grad school. I was not a major, my photography wasn't my major, il illustration was. But I came back and I wanted to photograph not just my little friends and immediate family, but the mystery club. I'll show you some other pieces. These are members, this is a, a father of a mystery club and a son in a mystery club. And as I show you some more pictures, I'll tell you about the mystery club. So the mystery club, my parents and 13 other couples had a mystery club in Long Island. I think my mother started it. And they would go like every month or two for like you know, 15 years where they would go on adventurous evenings where it was a total mystery together. I'm stopping on this because it's a good story. And I imagine coming, you're 10 years old and your parents come out home from a night out and they're laughing hysterically, or the next day they're laughing hysterically. Oh, what did you do with the mystery club? Oh, we went to a, had a seance. Oh, we went to Grumman Airport, or we recorded to see a, a, a rocket ship being built, or we recorded a song, an LP, or we went to a nudist colony, or we went to the, the Continental Baths, a gay male's bathhouse, and they saw a performer. They were very adventurous and open-minded. They were not swingers. They just were really open-minded of having a good time, having fun. You didn't, and I, it was subliminal. You don't have to go far to have an adventure. They didn't spend a lot of money. They just appreciated what was available around them and, and, and the, the flair of it. And that had a big influence on me. This is Fire Island, Terry Grove, someone I met through this goes to we had a house in Terry Grove, was always welcome. But this connects to this is especially for Mary Lee and the audience because we talked about Girl Scouts. I was a Girl Scout, and yes, I did many sit many, many self portraits as myself as a Girl Scout. I will again. But when I was at a Girl Scout camp one summer, we, we did an overnight on Fire Island, and, and people would talk over there across the water. There are naked fairies in little houses with names like Shirley Temple, meaning the houses. And I thought, wow, oh, that's amazing. I want to see them. I want to see those little fairies. I want to meet them. I didn't know that you know, 20 years later, I'd meet them and these were the little fairies in the little houses. I didn't know what they were talking about, but I always loved Fire Island. Last summer, was a, during the pandemic, was the first time I did not go to, go to the beach. Another one of my obsessions was going back to revisit places I didn't photograph growing up. There's so much part of my experience. So I went back to my high school and I did my younger brother's homecoming dance. And I went to the proms and here's to your proms in high school. This is a prom night at a, at a disco, Le Bouche. And look at their styles, you know, it's, it's they're fabulous. They're fabulous. Very personal. This is what my, I mean, someone I know since I'm like, you know, 10 years old. No, 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 I'm sorry. We actually met at ballet school when we were seven. And I was her bridesmaid for her wedding. She was upset because the flower was arrived late. Because this is a photograph only a bridesmaid and good Frank could take. And it's about family. This is about my cousin, my cousin's wife and her son. Very intimate. The same things I photographed in those little, in those little family albums, family, friends, trips. That her, that same woman's daughter, and people. people this this is uh, 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 what can I say? Inter, uh, internet hit, and people write. Oh my God, I, we're sure that that girl is now really angry. This is my cousin, she, she loves this picture. This is all consensual. <laughs> it's my family bathroom. So it's, it's my little cousins, my little second cousin at our house on Rosh Hashanah. And you can see there's, uh, there, there's a replica of the stained glass windows by Chagall. There's culture everywhere. Do I still photograph? You might as well ask me if I still breathe. Yes, of course I still photograph. But so some things seem oddly familiar, like in that nightclub, 
in 78, G.G. Barnum's, this is the house of yes in Bushwick. I'm like, oh, you know, I've been here before, but I could appreciate a new. Some things seem very familiar. Lightwork helped me get back to my analog roots. I have all these negatives that I never had the time to print as I wanted to, or even to show them. And now pandemic project, boom, boom, boom. Basement darkroom, and I'm printing tonight as we speak. So it's very, to me, it's really exciting because it's not, the, to me, they're not the same. Yes, maybe on a, a computer screen or printed in, on paper, you can't tell the difference, but seeing a gelatin silver print, it has soul, it has spirit. I actually think photographs have spirit. So that's what I'm up to. I'm printing stuff for my next show. Some tips and techniques I've, I'd like to share. I personally usually ask the subject's permission. Again, I figured this out. I don't go to photograph, I photograph where I'm going. It's, you know, yes, if someone wants to hire me, I'll do that. But really it's, it's places I want to go to or when I'm on the way there, I see things. I photograph things that look very familiar. It could be just like something right out of Norman Rockwell or like I've never seen anything like that before. No right or wrong, do what feels right for you. And it doesn't have to be dogma. You can change your mind. There's no police after you for this, you know, just do what feels right for you in your passion. It's all in the editing. Lessons I've learned. I figured out, just like this first little diary, that for me, photography is a form of memoir. And literally when I look at my negative pages, I see writing I did about what I did that day, what upset, what upset me, what happened, who that was. Editing takes time and perspective. I've had a very, very hard time editing my work years ago. Push it back. The blessings of time, I have different eyes, different eyes and different perspective, but also even now, and I've been intently looking over the past few years, I see things new all the time. But I've also a tip for some of us who have trouble acknowledging our own strengths. Well, something I do is I, I pretend I'm not Meryl. I'm looking at the work of this, this photographer, I, this artist, this person, Meryl Meisler. Very interesting. And I'm looking at her work like I'm an outside person. That, that helps. <laughs> something in life, you know, that everyone you meet is important. You don't know not just who will open the doors for you or whether they'll become something. They are important. And, 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 and I think that do unto others that you have them do unto you, I believe it. Inspiration come in unexpected ways. I didn't know mine would come in a, in a, a bathroom at a dragon burlesque house. It's important to find support, supportive people in community. I'm a Scorpio. Oh, I know about jealousy. I know about holding things in. It's much better to open doors for people. It feels better. It's much better to find friends, colleagues who support you, give you ideas. Find other ones. There's plenty of other people. Yeah, well, I belong to a, a group of fresh professional women photographers for decades. It's like my Girl Scout troop. Find people who understand or understand that you have a passion it's similar and go forth. If you're feeling stuck, take a class or workshop. It doesn't have to be about your, your art form. It could be something related. That, that helps also a lot. Education is great. Most important thing, you know, you say things you learn when you learn when you're kindergarten. This was a, a, a record I played as, as a, I don't know, five-year-old again and again and again and, and it was this character Tubby the tuba and he didn't want to be a tuba he wanted to have an elegant sound like a clarinet or a flute he wanted not this mm, puh, puh. and the elephant said to him you know be yourself he, he sang it be yourself you can't be anybody else be yourself. It's my advice to, to you. I'm going to sing it because it's also a lesson. I'm one of those rare people in life 
of this rare thing. I actually can't carry a tune. I was literally counseled out of my synagogue, very nicely, chorus. But the, be yourself. You can't be anybody else. Be yourself. That's my advice to you, or else you'll always be a nobody. So be yourself, or else you'll find your style. You'll find your passion. It'll find you. Just keep going. And I want to thank Lightworks. I thank you, anyone who's here, because, because Lightwork, all of you are a community. And we've helped, and, and any of us who are sitting here now, we are so fortunate to have made through this very difficult time. I, I am literally an open book. Your questions and comments are really welcome. Thank you so much, Meryl. Meryl this is, that was beautiful. That was thank absolutely, you. thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna just say that one of the last comments in the feed was um, you rock and we, we definitely wanna concur on that. Um, we do have some questions here for you. Thank you. All right. One of them is, um, can you discuss, can you discuss your transition from black and white to color? <laughs> well, it was conscious at first because, well, William Eggleston, right? He came out, I remember those books and I started putting in some color roles in my film, in my camera. But, and there was also in my drawing, when I was drawing and painting, I, I was having trouble going switch from black, white to color, so I took classes. But the big transition was happened because I, it had to happen. Number one, when I was going to clubs and, and dancing with my camera, sometimes I'd drop them and they would end up, um, have to go to repair. So then I would take a, my 35 millimeter would color slide film. So that was one thing. When I started teaching, I didn't have time to be in the dark room. I was like working all the time and planning. And so I just carried slide film, color slide film. I preferred, I did do negatives and I will tell you that negatives do not, do not stand up as well as color slides. Kodachrome was the best. So it was, at a necessity, it was an intrigue because yes, I'd heard about, I knew of Eggleston and I wanted to be hip, but there's also necessity, but it's also when I put it on, I actually don't like, for me, I don't want to take a picture and then decide to like, put, make it a black and white or make it a color. I, it's like putting on a dress. If I put on a gown, I'm ready for a dressy, a dressy occasion. If I put on a t-shirt, I'm ready for something else. So if I'm putting in black and white mode or black and white film, I'm seeing differently. I'm, I'm, my eyes are looking differently. Or well, I'm looking for different things. So I go back and forth between color and black and white, and I still do. However, now I am, am back Pursuing my love, which is black and white. I also, this is like a, a duplicate of the camera I used way back. It's just, I, it sees how I see. I love the split image. I'm excited to be developing film. I'm excited to be printing it. I think they're beautiful, but I still have it, you know, can't be point and shoot. And that's a perfect segue into one of our questions, which is what camera do you use now primarily? Primarily, <laughs> when, I, when the pandemic hit, I left my cameras home, so I had to order something, so I'm using this, but I have to, and this is a, that's how important it is, a Fuji film. I have to tell you, I have trouble. I don't like the little, I don't like the autofocus. I have trouble with autofocus. I'm better off focusing. I love, love, love this one because it's a split image. And I can see, I know what I know what I'm seeing and I know what I'm gonna get and I feel it. Or it's the right size. It's it's my favorite. But I have others. The, I, I did not make this up. The best camera is the one you have on you. Thank you so much, Meryl. 
Um, you did talk a little bit about um, you know, approaching people in the street. Could you talk a little, a little bit more about your process when you're out in the street and asking people to be photographed? I will, I have a philosophy what I realize I have is I, I don't run after things. You know, some people are aggressive, I don't run. It's just a picture, let it go. <laughs> It'll come, I have more like a, a, when I was a scuba diver and photographing underwater, if I would swim too fast, I'd run out of air. The fish will come to you. It's, um, I'm very like zen, walking along. If I see something, I see something. If I have a moment and, I, and I'll go, I'll literally go up to the person and say, may I photo take your photo? You know, do you mind if I take your photograph? And, and, and I tell them usually the reason why, like your outfit or, or your, your, your kid with the balloon or whatever it is. I'll, I'll say what it is that, that interests me. And I've noticed most of the time people say yes, because I, there is sincerity. Um, but if they say no, okay, okay. Because it's also a different world that people are more conscious of where their photographs will end up. I don't photograph people who are down and out. What can I say? I don't also don't photograph at funerals. I don't, you know, there's a lot of things I, I try to photograph uplifting things for many reasons. But lately I've been seeing some people on the, on the street and I have asked, for example, I saw a woman two weeks ago and she's, I just said, you know, just may I, may I? And she said, no, I said, it's okay. I said, I said, just want to let you know that you look beautiful. She did. She probably lived in the street. She looked beautiful. And she said, would you take my picture? I said, okay. <laughs> As, but I do, I do ask, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. Probably because I don't really want to. Just, just it's my way. I don't really want to offend anyone. I don't want anyone to be angry. I also like them to know. I just think it's kind of nice. That's 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 not that's not a, something rigid. It's something yeah. else. Throughout throughout your presentation this evening, it was really lovely that you pointed out moments and the images that spoke to your heritage. And there was a question about. How has, um, how has being a triple minority influenced your work or path and process? Would you mind repeating that question? Absolutely. The question was, how has being a triple minority influenced your work or path and process? I guess triple minority says that I'm a woman, a lesbian, and a Jew. Any others? Oh, no. How about now I am a senior citizen, right? Um, how has... It probably may, gives me stress, makes me see things differently. I don't, I don't know. It, 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 I don't know. It, it all influences you. Everything you, everything you eat influences you. Everything you see influences you. Everything that you experience influences you. It probably makes me more aware, and and I, I do strive to be an empathetic, open-minded. Good and you spoke to, um, in, in the contact sheet, you're very candid about um, mental health and depression. And you know, I was very touched myself in the image of the, that you, of the young man looking out and you say, this is what he's seeing you know, through his social studies class. So I'm wondering about as part of your practice, what does self-care look like for you? Yeah, that was, a, you know, everyone has different coming outs in their life. That was the first time I, came out about being a depressive. It was, here we are in the middle of a, a pandemic, which is was devastating. I've had a lot of personal loss in my life, people who took their life because of depression and anxiety. Um, I was seeing friends, like who I know for years, posting stuff, you know, like going through the depression this period. I'm you know, like, who? Me too. And they go, you too? It was like, Wait, me, you didn't know that. I think it's important to know that you're not alone. And and I believe that I be, for me, it's important to get professional help. But for me, that also that's part of the reason that I think my photographs do have a, a lighthearted look that I've not unconsciously, but maybe consciously, I was always looking for uplifting things. 
a lot of people who struggle with depression or many or have a many comics have a a common brand of having struggled with depression so i'm one of them okay but i'm i'm, I'm okay so i've got it in, i've got it in check but it's 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 part of it's um if you or someone you know suffers from this Imagine them, they're just saying you that they have asthma or diabetes. You wouldn't say it was because something they're not doing or this or that. It's a condition. In my opinion, you might be predisposed or something. And there are ways to work, to work with it. Having a sense of purpose and having interests and things that get you through dark things periods help you. So this, when I spoke with you, when, when you, when Lightwork asked me these questions and it was December and it's like, the holidays are coming. We're not going to spend Hanukkah or Christmas or New Year, I mean, anything with our friends or immediate family. It was like, oh. um, so I wanted to talk about it. It's a hard time. Is that an answering my question? I Absolutely. Think it is. Absolutely. And um, you, I mean, you spoke at length to the, of the number of years you spent teaching. How has being an educator influenced your photography practice? Well, I gave you a do now, didn't I? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, uh, it's totally a part of who I, I am. I, get, I mean, I, I literally taught for 36 years because after teaching full time, I taught another five years supervising future art teachers for NYU. Um, and maybe it's part of the reason I asked permission to take a photograph. Maybe it's part of the re re reason even now, and yes, my next book, I will talk, is coming out soon and it is the wildest one yet. <laughs> it's available, pre-order, Strand, and I'm gonna have a show at Clamp Art in the Center of Photography of Bushwick. Still, placing pictures next to each other, I'm going, I have to be very careful about pictures of children next to adults, how they, they're treated. I think that way. Even though these kids are now in their 50s, I would not, no, nope, this kind of picture cannot be with an adult picture. I currently right now have a, a, an article that was on, in the New Yorker and in the Instagram feed, they're posting the photographs I took inside the classroom. And this is, a, this is wild that I'm like photographs that I naturally did it, and my job between things, you know, mostly it's about classroom management, but sometimes I, I photograph and they posted a picture of a, a kid catching a, a quick kiss and I, and I photographed it, but then I said, you know, break it up, not in the classroom, not, you know, not, not during school. And so there's a big, there's a big discussion of teachers saying, this is not appropriate. How could she do that? And I want to say, they can't take away my pension now. You know, it's okay. Um, it, so as we come up on seven o'clock, our, our last question would be, because um, we have a lot of young and emerging artists and uh, photographers here with us this, this evening, what would be the advice that you would have given your younger self as you started on this journey in photography? I would say to my younger self, be glad that you didn't throw your stuff away. I'm gonna say, I'm going to say to Meryl, say, you know what? You did keep your work. It is in some kind of order. I'm going to say, good girl, and this is the teacher me trying to focus on the positive. Okay. You did keep your work in some kind of order. You did write notes. You know where to find it or you would do some research. Um, you didn't stop doing it just because at the, the time, you know, yes, you thought you'd be famous by the time you're 30 and it didn't happen. You didn't stop doing it. You have a right to do it. And, and, and younger self, yes, some people are shooting stars and make it. Other of us, we're late bloomers, we're slow simmers. It, it, that, that's what's most important. You just keep going. And, and I like what you did. I like that you focus on your health, your well-being. I'm, I'm complimenting a little Meryl. I'm saying, yeah, okay, you were hard on yourself, but you also sought outside care when you couldn't help things on your own. 
You also establish lifelong relationships that are healthy and good, that you've also surrounded yourself with finding different communities that help you and you help them that have you made mistakes? Oh yeah, but who hasn't? And, and the book that, hey, Sassy Seventies, the book Sassy Seventies is really a book proposal that someone had about my suburbia pictures, but was, there was a, a well-known photographer who had me pitch something, who had, had me, had a publishing company and was going to publish this work, but it didn't for many reasons. Surprise, your, your, your photo, photographs or whatever it is, whatever it is, your art form, fortunately, the current time proves with age because it's not just nostalgia and history, you also see the beauty. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be nice to, to little Meryl now and say, you yeah, know, okay, so you save too much stuff, but isn't it good you had that Girl Scout uniform? You know? <laughs> so I'm gonna be kinder to my younger self and say, you stuck it out. You found a way to support yourself. And that was creative. Teaching is very creative. I did very creative work with my students. My student, my student, the work I do with my students ended up ended up with the Whitney Biennial. You know, come on. Like, so I'm gonna say good girl, good going, Meryl. And do you having a problem right now? Give yourself a break and give yourself time. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Meryl. Thank you for bringing us the heritage of humor and for the impromptu concert this evening. It was really wonderful. <laughs> and we want to remind everyone to go to a, the Light Word website to see the images from this beautiful exhibition and to get the contact sheet, bring it right to your door so you can have those works and look at them. And we want to thank you again, Meryl, for the beautiful presentation. There's a lot of love coming through the chat right now. Um, and we want to thank everyone who's joined us via Zoom as well. Have a really wonderful evening and thank you again. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>